Hello again, class. Uh, today we're going to start our series of lessons on the Civil War. Uh, so I've been telling you uh, pretty much from the beginning of the school year uh, that this is where we're headed, that the school uh, year or our class is going to end with the Civil War and what is called Reconstruction. Uh, we're uh, they try to put the country back together again after four years of war. And so we're finally here. Uh, so let's talk about the Civil War. Uh, this is going to be the first in what I plan on being five uh, lessons. Uh, a lot of these will be uh, fairly short. Like I, I doubt today's lesson will be as long as, as most uh, lectures I record. Uh, we're just going to really start uh, talking about uh, the, sort of the, the very point where the Civil War began, uh, and then we'll talk about some key players and just each side's advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so before we get started, let's just review. Uh, in our last lecture, we learned about the election of 1860, how the Democrats uh, nominated two people for president, how you had the Constitutional Union Party nominate someone, uh, and all of that uh, allowed Lincoln, uh, the Republican candidate, uh, to pretty much sweep all the states in the north and the two states out west, Oregon and California, and become the president, which then led to South Carolina and a total of 11 states uh, seceding from the Union. Right, but just because they seceded didn't necessarily mean there was going to be a war. Well, it probably did if, if anybody had been paying attention to, to how Andrew Jackson uh, reacted to South Carolina's threat to secede uh, back in the 1830s. Uh, and then what Lincoln had been saying. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, South Carolina uh, seceded in December of 1860. Uh, the actual fighting didn't begin uh, until April. And that's what we're going to pick up with today, uh, or start with today, Fort Sumner. Okay, so the Confederacy began taking over uh, the U.S. forts and military bases that were located in Confederate states. All right, so... Think about the unique system we have here in America, our system of federalism. Remember, that's one of our key vocabulary words going back uh, to the first semester. Uh, federalism is, the, is a system of government uh, where power is shared between a national government and you know, state and local governments. So, for instance, if you go to downtown Dallas uh, and you can go on, on Commerce Street, you know, on one block you have a courthouse that's the state courthouse. That is a Texas courthouse. You walk two or three blocks down the street, still on Commerce Street, and you find the federal courthouse. All right, that's the the courthouse for federal court cases and federal judges. Okay, so you know the question becomes is well, who owns that land that it's on? Uh, you know, you have this federal courthouse paid for uh, by the federal government. The employees there are paid by the federal government. So who owns that building? Who 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 controls and governs? Uh, that courthouse, because after all, it is sitting on Texas land, even though the building and all the people working in the building uh, are paid for by the federal government. Well, that was the same issue uh, when all of these states started seceding from the Union. What did you do with all the federal buildings that were in uh, this area? You know, what did you do, uh, especially with the military force? Uh, that had American soldiers in them, and it was paid for by the, you know, the federal, the national government. Okay, and remember, when I talk about the North, the United States government, I'll call them the Union, uh, because they were still a Union. They they wanted to keep the country united. Uh, when I talk about the South, I'll often refer to them as the Confederacy. Remember, they formed the Confederate States of America. So, what did you do with these federal forts in the Confederate states. The Confederate states said, hey, you're sitting on our land, so this fort belongs to us. Uh, and they particularly uh, took this position with respect to Fort Sumner, which is out in the Charleston Harbor, uh, Charleston being the biggest fort uh, in the south end where you have a lot of your um, trade, uh, international trade coming in and out of the south. You have New Orleans and the Mississippi River, but then on the east coast you have Charleston. So it's a very important location. And the Confederacy demanded Fort Sumner. But Lincoln uh, and the general that was in charge there at Fort Sumner, a guy named Robert Anderson, refused to give up the fort. I said, no, uh, these are Union. These are federal American soldiers in here. Uh, this was built and paid for uh, by the United States of America. Uh, the Confederacy can't have it. It's, it's ours. 
so a Confederate general, a uh, guy named Pierre Beauregard, uh, attacked the fort uh, on April 12, 1861. Uh, Anderson realizes, now remember, he's the Union general. Uh, he realizes that, you know, they're basically surrounded during this water on the fort. Uh, they're surrounded by the Confederacy. He's not going to be able to hold out for much longer or for very long at all. So he surrenders. Um, and the next day, uh, or he surrenders on April 13th. And then the next day on April 14th, the Union soldiers abandoned the fort. And so the Civil War has begun. And then, um, now up to Fort Sumner, you had only had seven states secede. Uh, I believe it was North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, and Arkansas, I believe, had not seceded as of the time of Fort Sumner. But once the fighting started, once it was pretty clear that, yes, we're going to have a war and people are going to have to pick sides uh, and to fight, uh, those four states I just mentioned went ahead and seceded. Uh, so now you have a total of 11 states seceded. All right, so who are the key players? Well, let me go over this first. Uh, the states that make up the Confederacy, uh, again, starting there in the, the northern part of the Confederacy, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, of course, and Tennessee, uh, Georgia and Florida, uh, then moving west, we get Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and finally Texas. Okay, these are the 11 states that make up the Confederacy. Now, if you look on this map, uh, you see some of the states are, are blue and red. I refer to those as the border states. Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, which, by the way, West Virginia was not a state before 1861. But when Virginia seceded, the western half of the state didn't want to leave the country. They didn't want to leave the Union. They didn't want to destroy the United States. Uh, so the West Virginia did not secede uh, with the eastern half of Virginia. All right, so that's why we have two states today called Virginia and West Virginia uh, because of the Civil War. And so West Virginia State, part of the Union, uh, along with Maryland. Uh, and so these are shaded, and it's going to be an important part of our story uh, in a couple more lessons. We'll get to it more. Uh, but slavery was still legal in these border states. All right, so we think about the idea that all of the, the states with slavery seceded and all the, the free states stayed behind in the Union. But that's not, it's not entirely true. Uh, you did have this handful of states, all right, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, and Maryland, uh, who still had slavery. And slavery would still be legal all throughout, uh, or, or at least through almost all of the Civil War in these states. But they stayed part of the Union. All right, to them, the, the, the threat of, uh, that Lincoln posed to, to slavery was not worth destroying the country for. Uh, so they stayed part of the country. But the other 11 states seceded. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about key players. <clears throat> All right, Abraham Lincoln, by far the most famous person associated with the Civil War. Now, he was born in Kentucky in 1809. Very, very poor childhood. A very, very poor childhood. Um, that's where, you know, if you ever heard people talking about Lincoln living living in a log cabin, you know, this is what they're talking about. Probably had dirt floors. Uh, his mom died when he was young. His father would be away for long periods of time. Uh, but Lincoln, you know, wanted something better out of life. And so uh, he spent as much time as he could reading and trying to learn, uh, trying to, to learn things and to make himself smarter. So, uh, you know, he could have a future for himself. All right. So that's that's the key. Uh, you know, when people, you know, want something good for their future, uh, people like Lincoln show work hard, uh, spend a lot of time in books. That's the way you learn things, um, and that helps you get ahead. And that's certainly what Lincoln did. All right. Now he was born in Kentucky, but he spent uh, almost his entire adult life uh, in Illinois. He became a lawyer, uh, lived most of that time in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, which is, is the capital. It's not a, a giant city, but it is the capital of Illinois. Uh, and as we remember from the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he had run for Senate in 1858, but he lost. Uh, but that did uh, make him famous uh, nationally, uh, famous enough to then win the presidency in 1860. And as you know from our prior lesson, uh, he became the 16th uh, president of the United States. Okay. Ulysses Grant. 
it's important that you keep all of these people people straight. You need to know, you know, who was on the, the Union and who was for the Confederacy. All right, so Grant was born in Ohio. Uh, he would he would live another 20 years after the war, uh, not particularly to an old age. You can see there he died at 63 uh, from cancer. I believe it was stroke cancer. Um, so as you'll see, none of the people we talk about here live a whole lot. Uh, Lincoln, you saw, die in his 50s. Grant's going to die in his 60s. Um, the people from the Confederacy, uh, ironically, will actually uh, live a bit longer. So Grant graduated from West Point. Our West Point is our country's army, our military college. Okay, so if you want to be an officer in the army, uh, you go to college at West Point. That's the, probably the quickest, easiest way to become an army officer. All right, very good college, very difficult to get into. Uh, so that's where Grant went to college. He fought in the Mexican-American War like so many of the generals in the Civil War. Uh, they received their, their sort of their training um, in the Mexican-American War, and that certainly is true for uh, Grant as well. Now, he wasn't very high up in the Mexican-American War. He was still pretty young, probably in his you know early to mid-20s. Uh, so I think he may have been a captain at the highest. Um, but he still, nonetheless, uh, did receive some his training and experience from the Mexican-American War. Now, he ended up leaving the Army. Now, he was in the Army for, for a while longer um, after the Mexican-American War. Left the Army, mainly because he had a drinking problem, uh, and he kind of got run out. Uh, and then he spent the better part of the 1850s uh, basically just being poor and unsuccessful. Uh, he tried farming. That didn't really work. You know, he ended up working at you know, like his brother's store or something as a clerk. Um, he was not as successful outside the Army. He had a very tough, tough decade there in the 1850s. Uh, but then the Civil War began. Uh, so the North and Union needed all the people they could, could get for the war. And, and having this guy who at least had some experience, who had gone to West Point, had some experience being an officer, um, was great. So they took him in as a volunteer, I'm sorry, as a colonel in the Illinois Volunteers. Uh, and as we'll see, he's going to quickly work his way up. Um, basically, he kept winning battle after battle, uh, and so Lincoln kept giving him promotion after promotion. Because most of the generals that Lincoln was trying at the start of the war uh, weren't real successful. Uh, they weren't having a lot of success. Uh, but here you had this guy, Grant, um, who every time he fought a battle, uh, the North did pretty well. And so Lincoln kept giving him promotion after promotion. But by, finally, by the middle of the war, uh, Grant is, is in charge of the entire Union Army. And then, uh, a few years after the war, uh, sort of like how George Washington won the Revolutionary War and became our first president, uh, Grant's going to win the Civil War, and he's going to, uh, very soon after that, also be elected president. He'll be our 18th president. All right, so now let's talk about the Confederacy. This is Jefferson Davis. We talked about him already uh, in our cause of the Civil War. Uh, he was also, uh, like Lincoln, born in Kentucky. All right, so both the presidents on both sides uh, were actually born in the same state. And remember, Kentucky's a border state. So you had slavery there, but it didn't leave the Union. All right, so, you know, um, you had a lot of people sort of stuck in this this world between slavery and between free states. Uh, both, I know Grant, and I believe this is true of Lincoln too, both of them uh, married wives uh, whose family had owned slaves, or actually owned slaves during their marriage, um, even though both of, of those guys were, were against slavery. Uh, so you, you had this weird mix going on there. Uh, but anyway, Jefferson Davis, born in Kentucky. Uh, now he, he's going he's gonna to live into the day. Uh, before the Civil War, he was a senator from Mississippi. Uh, so remember, you know, you, you know, in the 1850s, you had a country with all these states, and they each had representatives, and they had senators um, in, the, in the U.S. government. And so what happens is when all these states leave, well, all their senators leave also, and, and their congressmen leave the country also. And so they typically become the leaders of the Confederacy. Uh, and so Jefferson Davis is elected president of the Confederacy. He's going to be the first and only president. Uh, mainly because the Confederacy is only in the last you know, four and a half years. So he'll be the only president they have. 
Uh, an act of war. He was one of the few people in the Confederacy who was actually punished for the rebellion. Uh, so he spent two years in prison for treason. Uh, as we'll talk about when we talk about Reconstruction, the, the general idea uh, that the Union and that Lincoln and Grant and, and you know the people uh, in the North had was just let the Southerners go back to their the South. We're not going to try to punish them anymore. You know we've already burned down half the, the South and you know, hundreds of thousands of people died. Let's just try to get the country back on its feet and instead of going around trying to you know, throw the Confederate leaders in jail. So for the most part, most of them didn't go to jail, but Jefferson Davis was the exception. Okay, uh, Robert E. Lee. Uh, born in Virginia, 1807. He's going to die in Virginia, 1870. So again, he only lived to be 63. Uh, not, not a real long life. Uh, now, he was from an old, very important Virginia family. All right, his... Um, was it grandfather? Yeah, grandfather, I believe. Grandfather and granduncle uh, both fought in the Revolutionary War, uh, were advisors to Washington. So Lee comes from this very old, rich, um, well-known, important family in Virginia uh, who had been very uh, integral in creating the country. Um, and, and Lee is actually a general in the American Army um, at the time of the war. And, you know, the stories are that he struggled uh, with whether or not he was going to go fight for the Union Confederacy, because I believe Lincoln offered him the job to be one of the leading generals in the, the Union Army, uh, but ultimately Lee decided he could never lead an army uh, against his home state of Virginia. Because uh, remember, this is some of the lessons we haven't talked about in a while, but remember our lessons from the very first of this year. You know, I told you, going back to the colony days, uh, these people always identified more with their colony or their state than they did as a country as a whole. Uh, and you still see some remnants of that uh, during the Civil War. And you know, it's why we have this idea of sectionalism, caring more about your section. And so ultimately, Lee decides, you know, you know I don't know that he necessarily wanted Virginia to secede, uh, but um, when it came right down to it, he picked Virginia over his country. Uh, now, just like... Grant, uh, Lee had graduated from West Point, uh, fought in the Mexican-American War. Uh, now, the difference is Lee had finished, he's a little bit older than Grant. Lee had finished, I believe, either first or second in his class at West, at West Point, uh, where Grant was just sort of a, an average, okay student. Uh, Lee was always, pretty much from West Point, he was always sort of like a star in the military. And he would serve for almost the entire Civil War as the lead general for the, the Confederacy and the Southern Army. All right, so going into the war, each side has advantages and disadvantages. So what were the advantages in the North? Well, the North had more of just about everything. Uh, they had more people. So if you look at this, this these graphics on, on the right of your screen, you see, you know, over 70% of the people in the country lived at, within the Union. Uh, versus only 29% in the Confederacy. Uh, so this is going to be a big a big deal, uh, because basically the South, kind of the reason the war ends is the South's going to start running out of people to keep fighting. The North, as we know, had almost all the factories and manufacturing. All right, I, I've been telling you that, and we've been talking about that pretty much since, since August or September. Uh, all the factories and manufacturing in the North because the South was nothing but, but cash crops and a slave-based economy. And most of the railroad lines, uh, again, which are built with, with iron and steel that comes from factories, so most of the railroad lines are in the North. So the North's going to have a great advantage. They can move supplies and food and troops back and forth uh, across the Union much, much faster than the, Union, and then the Confederacy can. Uh, because the Confederate, they, I mean, they do have some railroads in the South, but just not as many. All right, so those are the advantages uh, for, for the Union. What are the Southern advantages? Generally speaking, they had better generals. Uh, most of the leading generals in the United States Army in 1860 uh, were from the South. Uh, remember, Grant, who's going to end up leading the North, he was out of the Army uh, at this point. 
And so most of the people in charge of the United States Army in 1860 all leave to go join the Confederacy. Not all, uh, but most. Uh, there were certainly more experience and more talent uh, in, in your generals in the South. And finally, most of the war was fought in the South. All right, and, and so, and we saw this during the Revolutionary War. During the you know 1770s, America could not have gone to England and conquered England. Uh, there was no way America's army was strong enough. But you know, America's army with French help was able to fight off England on America's own soil. And, and the South has the same advantage. Most of the war is in the South because remember they've left. So it's up to, to the Union Army to convince them that, no, you can't leave. You have to, to still be part of our government, which means the Union Army has to go and basically conquer the South. The South doesn't have to conquer the North. The South's not trying to change anything about the North. The South's just trying to create its own government, and so the North has to come into the South to stop them from doing that. And it's a lot harder to fight on someone else's soil and, and to conquer someone on their own territory. Uh, than it is to, to be defensive, to defend your land. Uh, so all the South had to do was defend these attacks from the, the, the Northern Army. So those are the advantages and disadvantages. We'll see how those play out in the rest of our lectures. Uh, our next lecture will focus on the war's early years, all right, 1861 and 1862.